Okay, so I think I finally have enough uh, responses to do my kind of Q&A thing. Um, a lot of these questions, I do think I have enough to say about them to make a whole video on them. Um, so some of these may become larger topics uh, or I may not fully express my opinion on them just because there are quite a few of them and I want to try and keep this a decent like decently short video while getting to everyone's question that I left a heart on because I said I would do as such. I didn't expect to get this many questions, so I kind of preemptively just liked every question that I thought was a good question, and now I'm like, okay, so here we go. I don't know. Let's get into it. <laughs> Okay, so first question is from Surfy. Before I even move on, I just want to say sorry for how many people's usernames I'm going to pronounce wrong. <laughs> what is your opinion on microlabeling and where do you draw the line if you have an, uh, if you do have an issue? Also unrelated, what is a superior candy in your opinion? Uh, answering the second question first because it's easier. Vic Lynch is the best candy and if you say it is the same as Kit Kats, I will fight you. Um, I have like a 12 pack of them that the that I brought back from Norway. There is no, there is no competition. Okay, and then the actual question. I think it depends on if you're micro-labeling sexuality or gender. Sexuality micro-labels, um, I think, are mostly harmless. I do think that the purpose of LGBT labels or religious really labels in general is to communicate an idea. Like, if I say I'm gay to someone, to, to a woman hitting on me, that communicates that I am not interested because I like men, right? But if I say I'm a micro-label sexuality, it's not well enough known for that label to have any communicative purpose. Um, that being said, I while I think that they kind of defeat the purpose of having a sexuality label in the first place beyond just validating your own feelings, I don't really think they're hurting anyone. Um, I think there are exceptions to that where they can result in erasure for the identity that they kind of fall as a subcategory below, which I have mixed feelings on with pansexual, which is a question someone asked here, so I will get to that later. Um, but in general, sexuality microlabels, I would say are pretty harmless in most, not all cases, if not kind of pointless. Gender microlabels, however, I have a bigger issue with, um, and this does not just extend to xenogenders because arguably those aren't microlabels, they're just stupid. But um, I don't love gender microlabels because, I mean, a lot of reasons. This is one of the areas that I could make a whole video on. So if you want to see that, let me know. But I'm going to shorten it a bit here, basically. I think that they are not real. Um, I think that they are explaining how everyone has a varying experience which is fine and all, but that doesn't make it a separate gender. And I think that kind of comes back to my whole trans medicalist and the thing I talk about with um, the science behind being trans and stuff. You still, at the end of the day, are a man. One of the bajillion genders that has man or boy or male or whatever tacked on to the end of it, that's not a separate gender. That's you explaining tiny little minute details of your personal experience and assuming that that creates a whole separate gender. It doesn't. Everyone experiences literally everything differently. Being a unique individual does not mean that your gender isn't what it is. And I think micro labels in particular show this because at least with xenogenders, it's its own thing. Like it's separate. Um, and that's not to say that these are more harmful. It's just like, at least they have that. But this is still saying, I am a man, I am a woman, I am non-binary, but feeling the need to uh, tack on little personal experience things to it, which I think also kind of proves my point that a lot of people can't separate uh, their personality as a whole or who they are as a person from their gender identity. To them, their gender identity is their whole identity and their whole identity is their gender identity. And it's like meshing those two things together in ways that are not helpful at all and are confusing and annoying and completely unnecessary. So I guess uh, I have a more mild issue with gender micro labels and I generally don't see a problem with sexuality ones for the most part. Second question is from Critotonin. Again, sorry about the names. 
what is your favorite cartoon? So I assume we're rolling, ruling out anime here. Um, Bojack Horseman, hands down. I love Bojack Horseman. I have seen it. I lost count at five times. Fucking love that show so much. Second question from them is, what is your favorite color palette, warm or cool colors? Um, so I tend to use a mixture of both. I like complimentary kind of things. But if you mean for like an overall piece, like the tone of said piece, uh, probably cool colors. Whenever I do traditional or non-furry art, uh, I tend to like using really muted colors. Um, or like neutrals, and for me those tend to lean on the cool side, but I also like a variety. I don't know, I'm one of my favorite things about art is color, so I, I like a variety, but I guess I tend to lean towards cold colors. <laughs> um, Alex asks, what is your general opinion on self-diagnosis? I am not going to be answering that here, but I wanted to acknowledge that question since it was left under my Q&A thing. Uh, I have a literal video with almost that as a title. It's like my blunt and honest opinions on self-diagnosis or something like that. It's my first video on self-diagnosis. It is not the best made video ever because it was one of my first videos, but I, if you go to the mental health playlist on the homepage of my channel, there are multiple videos on self-diagnosis there. Um, and I think that those will give you a general idea. Uh, I have too much to say about it to go into it here, especially when I already have other videos on it, but thank you for asking. I uh, just thought I'd direct you towards those. Spine asks, thank you for the pronounceable username. Uh, what is your opinion on queer baiting? So I'm going to define queer baiting as intentional queer baiting because there are some things that a lot of people label queer baiting that just aren't, um, that are characters with like no, like just because they have chemistry does not mean that they were intended to be queer baited or characters that are very close um, platonically and then people take that platonic love as they're being queer baited. So I, I'm gonna talk about this as though intentional queer baiting, um, not kind of misconstrued or I wish they were a couple and then people calling it queer baiting. <laughs> Pretty standard. I mean, I do think people call queer baiting too much when it's not there, but on genuine queer baiting, it is a problem and it's, also, this sounds kind of shitty. It's it's kind of a problem of capitalism, too. They want the gay audience without actually doing anything. Um, and I think this is more understandable in children's media, whereas it's going to be very, very difficult to get an openly queer relationship on television. Um, that being said, there are instances of it happening. I haven't seen The Owl House, but I know it happens there. Um, later seasons of Steven Universe with... Sapphire and Ruby literally having a wedding. I do think as society progresses and in today, I do think they should at least try and represent LGBT relationships or characters um, without queer baiting in children's media. But I, I'm more understanding of it in that context because it's not as easy. But with any non-children's media, like not like Cartoon Network or whatever, I don't think there's any excuse for it. Um, like, not that the excuses for it on children's media are good, but they're realistic um, in terms of what's actually going to get past a channel. But in adult media, like, why can't we just have gay characters? Why can't we just have trans characters? I don't see why there needs to be some kind of, we're dangling it in front of the audience's face in trailers, and then when it happens, you think that scene is gonna happen, and then it's like, oh, nothing happened. Like, there's no need for that. If you don't want LGBT characters in your story, don't put them in your story. Um, and if you do, then actually pursue it. And that's not to say that any of those characters even need to get into a relationship. Like, for example, Always Sunny in Philadelphia, right? Mac. Mac uh, is very clearly in love with Dennis, right? Mac and Dennis never end up together and they would be horrible for each other. But Mac is not queer baiting despite him not being in a gay relationship with the character that he is interested in because he is, towards the end of the show, very openly gay. There's a whole episode where he's trying to figure out, like he thinks he's Irish and he's not. And then he's like, well, my whole personality is being gay now because that is my only other sense of identity. Um, like he is not queer baited in the slightest, even in earlier seasons before he is out and adamantly denies that he's gay, he is not queer baited because all the other characters know and acknowledge that he is gay. 
So having LGBT characters in your piece of media does not need to equate to it being an LGBT love story or have that character be in a relationship. You can acknowledge that that character is LGBT without making it the central focus of your show or book or whatever. Uh, and I think a lot of people who write shows and movies and stuff forget that. They don't think about the fact that a character can be gay and it not have the entire plot circle around them being gay. And that's not queer baiting because you're still actively acknowledging that that character is gay and allowing it to exist. <laughs> okay, moving on. I had a lot more to say about that than I thought. FNAP Kayla 32 asks, when did you start being a furry and what artists inspired you? Not necessarily other furries. I have been a furry since I was like nine. I know a lot of people say that as in like, oh, I really like Disney movies or whatever. Like I wanted a fursuit when I was nine. I, I got my first fursuit at 14 and I had been saving for it since I was nine. Uh, so I've been a furry a long time. I, I could argue maybe I've been a furry a little longer than that too, because I had my first fursona, uh, Speckles, who is in all these videos. He's a little brown and blue cat. Uh, I have had him since before that. Uh, I just didn't know what a furry was, but I have actively identified as a furry since I was nine. Um, and artists who inspired me, furry or not. Um, this changes a lot. I think whenever I first started out, um, I think artists who really inspired me were a lot of Warriors animators on YouTube. I used to love Spotted Fire 25. Like, I actually have this, my family, as in my family, I do this and my mom puts it on the tree, has this tradition of drawing um, Spotted, or not Spotted Leaf, uh, Squirrel Flight every single year. Or no, it's still not Squirrel Flight. It's Leaf Pool. I'm just dumb. I didn't draw her properly, so my brain can't recognize what she is. Drawing Leaf Pool every single year on a Christmas ornament and putting it on the tree. And the original one from when I was a tiny little kid done on a piece of paper with crayons is a fucking ugly ass, sad carbon copy of Spotted Fire 25's art. So she was my big inspiration starting out in this kind of type of art. Uh, but in terms of artists who've inspired me in general or currently, not like to start drawing, um, I think Aaron Blaze is someone that I look up to a lot. He's an animator, a uh, professional animator. He also has a YouTube channel and has a lot of um, animation education online. He is absolutely incredible. And I could honestly, I don't even know if I'll ever get to that level, but I can only hope. Um, in terms of, and I, you could arguably classify him as a furry artist. He mostly animates furries, but he's also uh, like a professional animator and not a part of the community, but mm, still borders there in terms of me inspiring my furry art off of his animation. Um, and for like modern warriors or furry artists that I really look up to, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce their username, Luxy, Luxy. They're incredible. Absolutely amazing. 10 out of 10. Um, also, all of the people who participate in Cheetah Z maps and Cheetah Z, I believe that Cheetah Z does not like me because they're friends with someone who actively hates me. But you know what? They, they can hate me. That's fine. They're still a really good artist. Go off. Uh, also, Rose Shards, who... I guess counts under people who have been in Cheetah Z maps, but they're also incredible. Okay, moving on. This is a little list of questions from um, Kit Kat. So one, how did you figure out you were FTM? Um, I came out at 14 or 15. I can't remember how old I was. I remember what school year it was, but I don't remember if I was 14 or 15. Um, and I initially came out as agender. Before that, I kind of knew I was a man, um, and I didn't really even know that being trans was a thing. And for some reason, my brain thought I could ease into coming out by saying I'm agender and then telling them I'm a man. Like, it's like taking little steps, like, oh, it goes from female to nothing to like, I don't know. I don't know what my thought process was there, but I still knew that I was FTM. I just thought for some reason, my parents would take it easier if they still thought there was a little part of me that was like not a man didn't work out. It presented problems. Don't do that. That's a stupid choice. Don't do that. It was, it created problems with my parents and me being trans. They're supportive and good. That's not shit on them. It just presented issues that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Uh, but I think I came out as FTM around 16. Um, but I kind of always knew, I mean, I don't think anything made me figure out I was FTM, I guess, when I figured out what being trans was, I figured out that it wasn't horribly abnormal and that I wasn't just delusional, but I kind of always knew 
that I wasn't a girl. It just, I didn't know that that was an okay way to feel. Um, so I guess that sort of answers the question, maybe. I'm not really sure. Two, what is the best way to eat a Kit Kat? The best way to eat a Kit Kat is to not eat a Kit Kat and get a Kvik Lunge instead. Three, how many pets do you have and what animal are they? Uh, three, sort of four. One of them is my mom's dog, but he's still my baby. Um, I have a golden retriever named Elder Price, who is named after the Book of Mormon character. He is a service dog still sort of in training. He's technically a fully trained service dog, but I still have more I went to work on him with, and he can't do mobility work until his second birthday, which is coming up in February. So sort of still in training, sort of not a golden retriever, Elder Price. I have a dwarf rabbit who we think is a lion head mini rex mix named eggnog and he is the god of chaos if you would like to join his little religion and acknowledge that he is the god of chaos you can join my discord server cult of eggnog um and i have a, a sort of tuxedo cat but a little too much black to be a tuxedo cat i have a kitty named rice and he is my baby and he is staring at me right now through the door because he really wants into my bedroom and four, what is your favorite religion slash what religion do you think is the least problematic? Um, I wouldn't say I have a favorite religion, at least not one that's a real religion. Uh, but I think least problematic. I, I can't say this confidently because I don't know every religion ever, but one that I know things about. Probably Jainism. Um, I am vegetarian. I would like to be vegan, but it's not really realistic for me. Uh, and I do love the um, animals have just as much value as living beings as people do kind of sentiment I do really like that about Jainism um so I guess I would say Jainism but it also has problems with it as well that make th that I wouldn't say it's unproblematic because with that all life is valuable all the way down to bacteria comes anti-abortion sentiments some more extreme Jains won't take antibiotics etc um, so I do still have issue with it. And of course the supernatural aspect of it, but overall, I think the philosophy of it is my favorite, uh, and the least harmful, even if I still hold issue with it. Five, do you love Breaking Bad or have you moved on to a different special interest? I still love Breaking Bad, although I would not say it's a special interest. It's more of a hyper fixation, but yes, um, you can see all of my Breaking Bad memes and horrible drawings of Jesse over cat memes on my discord server yes <laughs> and last one from Kit Kat. six favorite ice cream flavor um cookie dough probably maybe i think it changes probably cookie dough <laughs> and next question from victor with two eyes do you believe jesus was a historical person i almost read that as horrible person do you believe jesus was a real historical person <laughs> um so i i have mixed feelings on this there is very, very limited documentation that Jesus existed um, from the time that he was supposedly alive from non-religious sources. Um, there, and there are documentations of him secularly after his time um, that were close to his time. But as far as I'm aware, there aren't any while he was alive. I could be wrong on that. Um I'm not doing like a whole research paper just to answer this one question. But as far as I'm aware, there's either none or very few. Um, that being said, I do think it's not that absurd of a claim to think that he probably existed and just all the stuff he did in the Bible was not necessarily true. So currently, I think it's unlikely that he was a historical person that in any way resembled the Jesus of the Bible. But I do think the Jesus of the Bible was maybe based off of a real person loosely um but i can't i can't honestly say that i think jesus as he was as a person was would be any way recognizable from the bible character at all uh if he existed in the first place but that is more of a question for religious scholars and such more than me because I haven't done a whole lot of research on it uh, but this is something I've thought about a lot and I would like to maybe do some more research into and make a video on once I get more information because I do have very mixed feelings on that okay moving on uh fire willow asks what is your favorite cat breed this is an easy one snowshoe cat that is what my persona channel logo whatever blue and brown cat uh that's what he is I love snowshoe cats they're a baby I love them so much they're kind of like fat fluffier Siamese cats with white paws and white markings 
Um, I love them with every ounce of my soul. They kind of just look like speckles, except instead of having like freckles everywhere, it just blends back. But they still do have freckles sometimes, which is adorable. I recommend you look up a snowshoe cat. They are the cutest fucking things ever. Love them. Want one so bad. I adore my cat. He's my baby. But if I ever get a second cat, I'm, I want to look into getting a snowshoe. Um, next question from Rad. There are three questions here, actually. Um, what is your favorite cartoon? I answered this earlier, BoJack Horseman. Uh, favorite candy? Again, I answered this early, Kvick Lunch. Um, and favorite dog breed? I'm sorry, Elder Price, my beloved baby. My favorite dog breed is a Brazoi. I love Brazois so much. They're so weird. I love them so much. I would give anything, not anything. I would give a lot of things to own a Brazoi. Um, Although I will have to say Golden Retriever is a close second just because my dog is a Golden Retriever. But Berzois will always be a place in my heart. Love them so much. They're so funny. If you've ever seen the like Babushka dog um, or that that dog is uh, or like little Russian lady dog, that's a Berzois. I love them. Uh, they're sight hounds. And next one from Shiho Hinamori. This is two questions, but first one is pretty quick. Um, where can you turn in fan art? And is there a reference of your OC? Um, best place to send me fan art is on Twitter. If you go uh, to my like info tab on my channel, there's a thing that says like all links or all socials or something on my Twitter. If you scroll down, my Twitter is on there. That is the best place to send me fan art. Uh, I'm not sure if my DMs are open. I don't remember. If they are, you're welcome to DM it to me. And if not, uh, you can tag me and I'll almost certainly see it. Um, and is there a reference for your OC? Also, yes, that same link on my channel, the all socials or all info or whatever. Uh, there is a toy house link on there. It's, it's a, just a little logo that looks like a house in a circle. I believe it's towards the bottom. And the character that is mostly on my channel is named Speckles. And he is a character on that as well as some of my other characters uh, who are more prominently featured on my animation channel. And then the more questiony question, um, how did you realize you were trans and gay or bi? Not sure exactly what you go by. The LGBT people I know have some pretty different coming out slash realization stories, and I would love to hear yours if you're comfortable sharing. So I went over the trans thing earlier, but I will touch on being bi. Uh, I go back on back and forth on not being sure if I'm gay or bi. Currently, I'm kind of going with bi loosely. I more just say I don't like dicks. Um, if you do not have a dick, probably fine. Um, I tend to like other trans men or uh, cis women or AFAB non-binary people. But that being said, uh, I'm also not sure if that's a trauma thing and maybe I am just bi and I don't know. It's a whole thing. Uh, but realizing I'm not straight, uh, whatever you want to call it before I came out as trans, I identified as a lesbian and I, there was, I think the first like gay crush I had not really gay anymore, I guess, since I'm a trans man, but at the time was this girl in I believe first grade that I was really, really good friends with. And then this other girl who I didn't like became friends with her. And that was the only reason I didn't like this girl. So we like fucking hated each other, like to the point where we would be physical with each other for like an entire school year. And then the girl I liked moved schools and we actually had a lot in common and I became friends with her and it was a whole thing. And it was really funny. Her name was Casey. Uh, I have no idea what happened to her, or where she is or what, she's doing now but if by some chance she comes across this hello um and then I guess realizing that I wasn't straight uh was the first relationship I got into was a um, middle school relationship as you do with this girl I had been friends with since third grade and uh have been friends with for like 13 or 14 years and recently uh kind of stopped talking to but um we, she was the first person I came out to, uh, both whenever I came out as trans and in this instant when I came out as gay. Um, and we dated for like a month or something. And then her mom was homophobic and then made us stop talking to each other. But we lived like two blocks from each other. So that didn't really work. It was a whole thing. Um, and she actually outed me. Uh, not, not my friend, her mom. Her mom outed me to my parents. And then at that point, I just... And I had already, like, by that time, I had already told all my friends I was gay. And I was so scared that they were going to hate me. And they literally told me, yeah, we knew. We just thought we kind of had a mutual unspoken awareness of this. And I was like, oh, okay. 
Uh, and then I guess I realized I wasn't, after I came out as trans, I just assumed I was straight for a while because I'd only liked women. And then I have dated two other trans men. Um, I go, I don't know. I just don't really think about my sexuality all that much. I'm just kind of like, whatever happens, happens. Um, so whenever I dated my ex from high school, um, not the ex I tend to talk about a lot, but an ex I dated in like, it was like 16 and 17, I think. Um, I just didn't think much about it. I don't know. Like I had kind of already gotten over the like worrying about my sexuality and trying to put a label on it. I just don't really care. So I was like, oh, I like this guy. Cool. Moving on. Like, I don't know. I just didn't put much thought into it. Uh, in terms of my identity, I was more worried about if he liked me or not than, oh my God, does this mean I'm not straight? Does this mean, does it, if he's trans too, does it mean I'm gay? Well, like I didn't, I didn't really think about that too much. Um, which is why I guess I kind of just loosely label it as I don't like dicks now. So moving on to the next question, um, from Arctic Sunset Cat. Have you seen or heard of the show Owl House and what inspired you to begin animation? Um, I have heard of Owl House. I have seen some like screenshots or snippets from it. Uh, I don't really know that much about it other than there's like a gay couple and an owl worm. That's really all I know about it. Um, I like the art. It looks nice. Um, I, I've considered watching it, but the fandom seems very inclusive to me. And I've already been down that route with my Steven Universe phase. So I'm a little hesitant um, just because... Steven Universe fandom turned me into a wild, inclusive, everything is valid monster for a bit. So I'm a little, I'm a little hesitant. Uh, that was a long time ago. That was like when Steven Universe was coming out. Uh, and I started watching it since it aired as it was coming out. So I don't know, a little, a little hesitant there, but not, a, not at all a comment on the quality of the show, more just the people surrounding it. Um, and then what inspires you to begin animation? I actually don't know. Um, I mean, I know artists who inspired the way I animate or what I animate, but I've been animating since I was little. I got my first, uh, tablet. It was like a little, it was a really, really old Wacom that they don't make anymore. Um, I don't know how old I was. I want to say I was 10, but I'm not really sure. I think I was 10. That sounds right, but I'm not positive. Uh, but I immediately just used it to animate. Uh, there is still a channel up on YouTube from, I believe I started it when I was 11. I'm not sure. I think, I think I was 11 or 12 whenever this channel was being used. It's still on YouTube. I haven't deleted it. So if you find it good on you, cause you're going to have trouble, but it's still up. I keep it up cause it's funny. All the titles have been changed to me insulting my old art, which I did when I was like 16 because I thought it was funny and now I regret it. Um, but honestly, I think I think just like the Warriors animation community as a whole, because before I did animation, I loved like the the late 2000s, early 2010s, like um, what's his name? Like Tad something uh, that like all of those funny Warriors animation memes, the like little uh, lucky, lucky dance, all of that stuff. I loved all of that old Warriors animation um, and I wanted to be involved in it I guess so I still have old animations from when I was like 11 or something up online if you feel inclined to go do some digging but none of the names of anything are attached to my channel now so you're gonna have a bit of trouble <laughs> so this next question is from Marco Viva the first part of the question is in reference to a specific study in the video that it was commented on um I do intend to make a whole video on that study so if you're watching this well not that study but heavily focusing on that study if you're watching this um I am not going to answer that here just because it's gonna take me a long time and this video is already almost 30 minutes but just know I'm not ignoring that part of your question I will be addressing it in the future um and if you watch my channel which I think I've seen you comment a few times then you'll see it um second part of the question is if brain characteristics are that important to trans medicalists? Would you support the view that, quote, how the brain is structured, end quote, should be thought of as a primary sex characteristic? Parentheses. I think it 
I think right now brain characteristics are seen as secondary sex characteristics. So analogous to something like height, or would you say it's a different sex characteristic altogether? So primary sex characteristics stay, then comes the brain as a secondary, and then comes tertiary sex characteristics for something like height. Asking this as these sex characteristics are generally seen as being important and part of sex distinctions and therefore in gender too. So I think I don't necessarily see an issue with uh, brain structure being classified as a secondary sex characteristic at the moment. But I also do think it would be interesting to see it be put in its own category because currently um, brain sex seems to be relatively independent. And I like to use the phrase like neurological intersex that your brain sex does not align with your secondary sex characteristics or your chromosomes. Um, so I do think it would be interesting and potentially helpful to have it be its own category, but I wouldn't necessarily put it in, in order like primary, secondary, and tertiary, because that would push down the currently secondary sex characteristics to being less relevant, um, which could have implications for medicine that are overarching. Um, but I think just having it have its own thing could be potentially helpful, um, especially as people begin to separate sex and gender. I think that having it be its own thing would help further separate sex and gender and allow the brain to basically be its own thing, um, that influences sex, but is not a part of it. Um, I, I know I use the term sexually dimorphic or, um, different sexes or whatever in regards to neurology. But that being said, it is more of an easy way to communicate it and using actual scientific terms being sexually dimorphic. However, it's not entirely accurate as a lot of trans medicalists and the people doing these studies seem to see the brain thing as the gender being separate from sex. So I think that that's a bit of a complicated question as I don't really see the brain sex, sexual dimorphism thing, actually being about physical sex, um, in that your brain determines your gender and your body and genetics determines your sex. So I personally think it would be interesting to see it have its entire own thing, even separate from sex. But at the end of the day, that may not be realistic. Um, so if that's not realistic, I would prefer to see it stay as a secondary sex characteristic, but I don't know. It's a gray area. Um, overall, unless it's separated for researching trans people specifically, I really don't think it matters too heavily what we label it as, as long as we acknowledge what it does and doesn't influence and how it came, comes to be that way. Um, the label essentially is just saying where to put it, um, but I think what's really important is more so that we acknowledge the way it works um, and do more research on it and stuff, regardless of how it's labeled. So next question. Oh, wait, not next question. I just realized they have a third question. Uh, why can't neurogenders as part of xenogenders use the same idea around neurological differences in the brain to explain gender experience? For example, the article brains of men with autism have some female patterns. Studies are shown. Studies are below the article. Why are neurological findings in people with gender dysphoria seen as important to trans medicalists, but neurological disorders generally don't indicate different gender experiences? I think it's because it's a different thing. It's a separate way that it functions. Like, for example, if you have damage to part of your brain that allows you to move half of your body, right? Like you have a stroke or something. Um, and the other half of your brain is unimpacted. Sure, we may compare the functions of one side to the other side, in terms of determining how to help that or understand how it happened or how it works. But that doesn't mean that the functioning side of the brain is now also a diagnosis, like functioning is not a diagnosis. And I think they're really just two separate issues. I don't know that much about um, neurology in autistic people and how structural differences vary in autistic individuals versus allistic individuals. So I don't know if the parts of the brain that are affected that are different in gender are affected in an independent way. However, if like you said, the male autistic people seem to have more female patterns, that indicates non-binary. That doesn't indicate like a separate gender. It's still invoking actual genders. 
Now, this this person didn't link the study they're talking about, so I have no way of knowing if this study that they talked about is actually a scientific study at all or if it's just an article in something or if the paper it's published in is credible or whatever. But giving the benefit of the doubt, saying that it is true and that this is real and a good source, the thing you're citing still says, still uses male, female, and presumably non-binary in the sense that we would understand it, maybe not in the paper. This person does not have a separate, entirely different gender. It's saying that the way that gender functions still aligns with male and female and non-binary. It's just there's a pattern of those people being or having trans characteristics as opposed to an entirely new thing. Like I gave this example in a comment. For example, autistic people process sound very differently for some people. I know for myself, I got back from the airport today and I was completely nonverbal the entire time I had my headphones on and refused to take them off otherwise because I screamed at my mother in the airplane for talking too loud. Um, I cannot handle overlapping sounds. It overwhelms me and it freaks me the fuck out. However, the fact that my brain processes sound differently and results in me reacting to it differently is not a qualifier to be part of hearing deficient communities. We should not add autistic to deaf, hard of hearing, and hearing. There is no deaf, hard of hearing, hearing, and autistic. It's just autistic people, assuming they're not also deaf or hard of hearing, are still hearing. They're just experiencing hearing differently. There's no additional identity or identifier, I guess, to that category because they are still a part of hearing. They just experience that label differently than other people who are also hearing. And I think that goes for gender too. The people who are autistic who are experiencing gender differently are still a gender. They are still a gender that exists, but they are experiencing that gender differently. And that doesn't mean they're a different gender. It means that they're processing it differently. Just like I may process hearing differently doesn't mean we need to add autistic onto deaf and hard of hearing. Just because you process gender differently doesn't mean you need to add autism to male, female, and non-binary. And this also kind of neglects to notice the fact that we actually don't know um, if autistic people experience gender any differently. The only thing we have to go off of that is anecdote. Again, assuming the study you cite is accurate and some polls and stuff which are iffy because they're often self-diagnosers and whatever, um, as I addressed in my no autism does not affect your gender video. Um, assuming like best case scenario that there is some correlation, the best information we have on this is that autistic people are more likely to be trans. It says nothing about them needing a separate label to identify that experience. And I also think the different gender experience, their words, doesn't matter because gender isn't the experience per se. Like if you are autistic, you perceive your gender differently. You have struggles with it, which I still think is an iffy argument, but moving on. Um, you perceive that differently, right? Your brain is still going to show up as male, female, or non-binary. And if there is an autistic third option, or not third, fourth option to that, if there is a fourth option to that, we don't know about it yet. There is no indicator that it exists. At best, we have that, again, assuming your study is good, that they're more likely to be in the middle. So at best, we have autistic people are more likely to be non-binary. But as far as we're aware, there is no fourth completely separate from the pre-existing options thing. So why do we need a fourth separate, not related to the other options, gender identity label for it? We don't. Because you're still male, female, or non-binary, your experience with it is just different. Just like you're still deaf, hard of hearing, or hearing, and autism or SPD may affect your experience with that. Different experiences with certain things does not qualify the actual thing being separate. So if there is some fourth brain sex that comes up that's exclusive to or mostly a part of autistic individuals, I would be open to hearing about it and potentially being more okay with specifically autism neurogenders and not others because that doesn't say anything about the others. Um, I would be more open to hearing about that. But as it currently stands, even with the thing you claim yourself, all it says is that autistic people are more likely to be trans, which says nothing about extra genders. Okay, moving on. Sorry, that was a little rambly. Uh, from Reiner, couple questions. One, do you have to be trans to be a trans med? No. Uh, most trans meds are trans just because we have more invested in the 
I guess, situation. Uh, but I'm sure there are cis trans meds. That's fine. I mean, I do think, uh, let trans people have more of the stage on speaking about it. But that being said, being trans med is simply valuing the science, the medical science behind being trans. And you don't have to be trans to value medical science that investigates trans people. So as long as you're not trying to speak on our behalf in terms of actually being trans, go off. Um, I appreciate allies in that area, and I'm sure other trans meds do too. And two, what are the arguments against pansexual and he, him, lesbians? So pansexual is one thing that I think someone asked a question about um, that I'll get to later. I have mixed feelings on it, so I'm not going to address that now. Um because I don't have arguments against pansexual that I feel are strong. Um, so I'm not going to give an argument against that when I don't fully believe my own arguments. But for he, him, lesbians, personally, pronouns are gendered, at least in English. Again, this is talking about English. The purpose of having multiple sets of third-person pronouns is to indicate both if something is a sentient being or not, like using it, as opposed to he, she, or they, and to indicate the gender of the person you're talking about. If someone goes by he, him, but by all means identifies as a woman and prefers other woman terms like Mrs., mother, sister, etc., calling that person he, him, especially considering that that is done by talking about someone in the third person and not directly to them, is going to confuse further conversation to a large degree. And it also, considering like it doesn't alleviate dysphoria because that person isn't trans, which makes misgendering seem like a mild ugh and not like transphobia. Pronouns are not an indicator of I am butch and I dress more masculine, therefore he, him. They are not a form of self-expression. They are language and the purpose of language is to communicate ideas. Using he, him on a woman does not efficiently communicate ideas. It defeats the purpose of multiple sets of pronouns and it defeats the purpose of words having meaning. It defeats the purpose of language as a whole being a method of communication. I do intend to make a whole video on why pronouns are gendered and how women using he, him, vice versa, and noun pronouns can affect trans people negatively. So I'm not going to go into it too much more than that. But essentially, the purpose of language is communication. This does not efficiently communicate anything. It puts trans people in a bad position. And also the fact that Lesbian means woman loving woman. I'm not entertaining the idea of non-binary lesbians. If you want a video on that, I will go into that, but I'm not pretending that is valid either uh, because I do think non-binary people have more reign on what pronouns they use as they may identify more on one end of the spectrum or whatever, um, as long as they're not solely identifying with their assigned gender at birth pronouns. I tend to not have an issue, but that's a separate thing considering I don't agree with the idea of non-binary lesbians either. Also, I was going to move on, but I realized both this is the last question and it was the question I was thinking about that was talking about pansexual. So I don't have any arguments per se solidly against pansexual. I have mixed feelings um, on pansexual. And at the end of the day, I guess what I think about it is that it is the same thing as bisexual. Um, with a little bit more specificity that you just don't have a preference. And there are a few different definitions people use of it. Some people say it means you like all genders, which can often be chalked down to being transphobic, saying bi, bi people either only like two genders, which has never been the definition of bisexual. Um, even if bi technically means two, that has never been what the word has been used to mean. Uh, it also is often used to imply that trans people are their own separate thing and not that they are male or female, meaning that they would not be included under the assumed two genders or that bisexual people can't like non-binary people, which is also not true. Um, and I do have a big issue with that label, but thankfully that is becoming the less common definition in favor of not having a gender preference. However, there are plenty of people who identify as bisexual that don't have a gender preference. And while I don't necessarily see a problem with using the word pansexual to mean I don't have a gender preference as a kind of subcategory of bisexual, I do think it can kind of contribute to bi erasure 
because bi people are already kind of either ignored or used as a laughing laughing stock in a skit or whatever as a whore or someone who like will fuck anything or whatever so we're pretty much not represented well um and pansexual is often used as the more like woke bisexual and i think that's a problem um if it were just the label on its own being i don't have a preference i also just wouldn't think that's a sexuality i mean a sexuality indicates who you are or are not interested in preference is not a part of that the same way i don't think demisexual is a sexuality on its own it needs to uh, like be paired on to like demi homosexual or something because it doesn't indicate what gender you are or aren't interested in it just says like qualifiers essentially um I don't really think it's a sexuality, I guess. I mean, not having a preference isn't a sexuality. That's just how you feel about your bisexuality, not its own thing. Um, but all that being said, using the label in the meaning of no preference, I don't really think is super harmful. Like, it's not my favorite thing. I do think it's kind of bi erasure and it has some bad implications on bisexual people. But I don't think it's the worst thing ever. Like, I am not going to not be friends with someone because they're pansexual I'm not going to openly say anything about it whatever like I don't think that it is a sexuality I think it is the same as saying I prefer brunette women um or I don't care if you're skinny or thin I don't that's not a factor on if I like you like it's that but as a sexuality which I just think isn't a sexuality like it just doesn't meet the definition but at the end of the day, it's not really a big issue to me. So I guess I think it's the same thing as bisexual, but do I really care about it enough to argue about it? No. Like, it's a meaningless label, but meaningless label doesn't necessarily mean harmful label. It just means, why does this exist? <laughs> so I guess that's the end. Um, I'm sure I'll be doing another one of these at some point. Um, but not soon considering this is 45 minutes long not counting the intro so um i hope that i got your questions answered thank you for watching uh hade i stare at the populace in prayer i look at them talking to the air i sing for them they don't seem to